In the previous week, we learned about transformer operations and parallel collections. In this week, we will study the implementations of these methods. We will see how the combiners are implemented for various collections and learn about data structures that are more amenable for parallel computations. So while the emphasis in the previous week was on data parallel APIs and parallel programming abstractions, this week's lecture will be more algorithmic in nature. It will give you an insight into how to pick the right data structure and organize the data in a parallel program. Recall that a transformer operation is a collection operation that creates another collection instead of just a single value. Methods such as filter, map, flat map, and group by are examples of transformer operations. By contrast, methods such as fold, sum, and aggregate are not transformer operations. We also learned that sequential transformer operations can be implemented generically using an abstraction called a builder. The builder trait in Scala takes two type parameters. T, which denotes the type of the elements of the collection, for example string, and wrapper, which denotes the type of the collection, for example a sequence of strings. This trait has two important methods plus equals, which is used to add an element to the builder, and result, which is used to obtain the collection after all the elements are added. For example, let's assume that a single processor has a sequence of strings Adam, Bob and Eve. To capitalize all the strings in the sequence, the processor needs to map each element. It starts by creating a new builder object and then adding the capitalized versions of the strings into the builder by calling the plus equals method. At the end, the processor invokes the result method, which creates the resulting sequence. Builders can only be used to implement sequential transformer operations. To implement parallel transformer operations, we need an abstraction called a combiner. A combiner is a builder with an additional method called combine, which takes the elements from two input combiners and produces a third new combiner. Here is an example. Given a combiner this with elements x, y and z, and another combiner that with elements u, v and w, the combine method produces a third combiner with the elements x, y, z, u, v and w, and in the process invalidates the old combiners. After the combine method returns, the old combiners can no longer be used, but the new one can be used in the parallel program. Making this operation efficient is not a trivial task, and as we will see, we need to find a way to make it fast. Before we start, let's consider what the combine operation means. It turns out that the meaning of the combine operation depends on the underlying data structure. The collection wrapper could be a Scala set or a Scala map. In this case, the combine operation represents a union. So given two sets, this with elements 1, 2 and 4, and that with elements 2, 3 and 4, combine produces a union with elements 1, 2, 3 and 4. When the collection wrapper is a Scala sequence, such as a vector or an array buffer, the combine operation represents concatenation. So, for example, given two sequences with the elements 1, 2 and 4, and 2, 3 and 4, the combine operation produces a new sequence with the elements 1, 2, 4, 2, 3 and 4. In both cases, the combine operation must be efficient. By efficient we mean it must execute in O of log n plus log m time where n and m are the sizes of the two input combiners. Why do we make this requirement? During a parallel operation, the combine method could be invoked multiple times. Assume for a moment that combine takes n plus m computational steps. If we have four processors executing a filter operation, then at the leaf level of the parallel reduction tree, they will traverse n elements in n divided by 4 computational steps. Each processor 
independently produces an array of elements it filtered. At the next level of the tree, two pairs of arrays would be combined in n divided by two computational steps by, for example, processors P0 and P2. Finally, a single processor would need to call combine to produce the final array at the root of the tree, which takes n computational steps. If we sum these computational steps, we will see that the total running time is 7n divided by 4, which is much more than n, the time required for a single processor to complete the filter operation. Although this is a very rough analysis which assumes that combine takes about as much time as filtering, we can see that combine must be more efficient if we are to gain any speed up. If we require that the running time of the combine operation is O of log n plus log m, the combine steps become insignificant in the overall execution time. In the following, we show a combine implementation for two arrays. For simplicity, we have slightly diverged from the previous combine signature, but the semantics of this method remain the same. Given two integer arrays, produce a third array, that is their concatenation. So here is a question for you. Is this method efficient enough? If you answered no, you are correct. This method takes O of n plus m time, where n and m are the lengths of the two arrays. To show this, let's count the total number of steps in this method. The first line allocates the resulting array R, whose length must be n plus m, and this requires n plus m computational steps on the JVM runtime. Then, the contents of the arrays are copied to R with the array.copy calls, which again take n plus m steps. In total, that's 2n plus 2m computational steps. In complexity analysis, constant factors are ignored, so we can write this as just O of n plus m. So in conclusion, the correct answer is no. This combined method is not efficient. So the question is, can we produce a more efficient combined implementation for arrays? We argue that this is not possible. Here is why. Computer memory can be visualized as a long tape. Any data structure that we use occupies a subset of locations on this tape. An array of length n is a very simple data structure that occupies a contiguous block of memory. The arrays xs and ys can be at arbitrary positions on this tape. The resulting array must also be a contiguous block of memory. If xs and ys were adjacent, we could return the resulting array by pointing to the start of xs. In this case, we would not need to copy anything. However, xs and ys could be anywhere, so we are forced to copy their elements to produce a contiguous, uninterrupted block. Let's consider some other data structures typically used in programming languages to implement sets and maps, and the efficiency of their operations. A hash table is a contiguous block of memory, partially populated with elements. To find or modify an element, we compute its hash code and use it to locate the element. Insert, remove and lookup operations thus take expected constant time, of 1. Balance search trees are composed of nodes that contain elements and optional child nodes. The topmost node is called the root of the tree. The nodes without children are called leaves. Balance trees usually have the property that the length of the longest path from the root to the leaf is never two times larger than the shortest path from the root to a leaf. In this case, the longest path from the root to a leaf is equal to 3, while the shortest path from the root to a leaf is equal to 2. Generally, this property ensures that the height of the tree with n elements is O of log n. One useful consequence of this is that it takes log n steps to reach any leaf starting from the root. Thus, lookup 
insert and remove operations take off log n time. A linked list is a linear arrangement of nodes, where each node except the last one has a single successor. Finding the element in the list requires traversing the entire list in the worst case, so the running time of their operations is O of n. So for example, if we want to check that the element 9 is in the shown list, we have to traverse half the elements in the list. Unfortunately, these standard data structures do not have an efficient union operation, making their combiners tricky to implement. As an exercise, we encourage you to try to implement the union operation for some of these data structures. Let's next consider data structures that are typically used in programming languages to implement sequences. Here again we get various operation complexities. Mutable linked lists have constant time prepend and append operations, but linear time insertion and lookup. So for example, if we want to append the element 9 at the end of this list, we simply need to update its tail pointer. Functional linked lists or cons lists have constant time prepends, but since their tail cannot be mutated, all other operations take linear time. Array lists used to implement array buffers in Scala have amortized off one append operation. Most of the time we append an element to the array list by filling in the first empty entry in the array. So if we want to add the elements 8 and 6, we just add them like this. When we run out of space in an array list, we simply allocate a larger array block and copy the existing elements. Once that is done, we can append the new element. On average, we do a constant amount of work when we append and only occasionally need to copy everything. Random access to elements takes constant time, but all other operations, such as prepend, take linear time. Except for mutable linked lists, concatenation for these data structures requires copying all the elements and takes a linear, often, amount of time. This lecture should have convinced us that implementing combiners is not trivial, since most of these data structures do not have an efficient concatenation or union, providing a combiner for the corresponding collections is not straightforward. However, things are not so grim. In the next lecture, we will see that it is indeed possible to implement efficient combiners for these data structures, and we will study the techniques used to do this.